Greetings and welcome. This is Come to the Fountain TV. I'm Apostle Julie Hardigan, an ordained pastor. Today we're going to be hearing from Pastor Eleanor Joy. She's going to be speaking on companionship, empty nesters, transitions, and traveling as a single person. Then I'll be coming back and talking to you about companionship, empty nesters, uh, making transitions, and traveling as well, and what God has to say about it. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning. Uh, I am Pastor Eleanor Joy with In His Love Ministries, and we would like to welcome you this morning to the Come to the Fountain Singles Conference. And as you know, that we will be, <coughs> excuse me, recording um, these sessions this morning. And so we welcome you and we pray that uh, these particular sessions that you've chosen to attend today uh, will be a blessing to you and that uh, you will receive a spiritual impartation and uh, that uh, you will be blessed. Amen. And that uh, maybe possibly you will receive a word from the Lord and something that is spoken this morning. Well, the session that you have chosen is session 11. Forgive us, we're a little uh, behind schedule this morning. But I'll be teaching, or rather I'll be speaking on companionship, empty nesters, and traveling as a single person. Uh, this particular schedule was updated on uh, July 7th. And what we did was we added a, another uh, subject here, which is transition. So you may not have that on your original schedule, but you might want to add transitions along with the other three titles. And uh, we'll just talk a little bit this morning about transitions as well. Well, first of all, I'm going to start off with companionship. I will be uh, teaching or speaking on these particular topics in uh, chronological order. So first of all, I'll speak on companionship. And if you have your Bibles, I don't have a lot of biblical texts here that I'm going to be referencing this morning in these particular topics. I just have a few. But if you have your Bible, would you turn to Genesis chapter 2? And we're going to read verse 18. And then we will read verse 21 and verse 22. So again, that's Genesis chapter 2. And let's go ahead and read verse 18. And the Spirit of the Lord is speaking here. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Okay, let's go ahead and read verses 21 and 22. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to back up here a little bit, and I'm just going to go back here and just kind of uh, gather my thoughts here, because what I want to do in these particular verses, there's some pretty strong language here that I don't want to pass over, it. but what I want to do is I want to expound here, because it's vitally important when we hear the Lord speaks, we want to really take notice as to what he is saying. And here in verse 18, it says, And the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. So if God takes notice of that, and he says that it's not good that man should be alone, we need to take that seriously, amen? You know, even though sometimes, you know, we, we want to be alone, maybe for a season or whatever, maybe uh, we're in some area or season of our lives that maybe we just want to be alone. But overall, on a continuous basis, God is saying that that's not good for us to be alone. 
So we need to really meditate upon that and say, you know, if I've, if I have begun to isolate myself or if I no longer find interest in having a mate, just know that the heart and the mind and the emotions of God is saying to you that it's not good that you should be alone. Amen? Okay. In verse 21 and 22, God is saying here, I'm going to say that again, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So that's something most often that we don't really take um much thought about but even though most often people refer to the female or the woman as the weaker set sex it's not so much that I would like to define her as the weaker sex but she is created she has a separate DNA amen God has built and constructed man with a different kind of DNA that is specifically to the male gender but then he's also created the female with a different type of creative DNA, which doesn't specifically make her the weaker vessel in terms of her emotions, her thought, her, her, um, her spirit, or anything like that. But it's just that she's different. You know, the man tends to be the person who wants to provide. He's the fixer. You know, the woman is the emotional one. You know, she sees the big picture. She's the one that nurtures. So even though she's a female, she's not necessarily the weaker vessel. But it's just that God has created her and made her DNA different. Amen. And so what they do is the male and the female, they complement each other. Amen. When we look at companionship, we have to look at it from different perspectives. First of all, we can look at companionship from the perspective of marriage. Someone who is uh, a widow or who has become a widower. Or from a single perspective or whatever your present condition of in terms of relationship with another individual. Since this is a singles conference, but of course the conference is not just for singles open only, the conference is open to everyone. Most of the since the conference since the conference, what I was going to say is a singles conference, I will not only Initially, I was only going to focus on the singles, but I know that there's a wide variety of different people here in different statuses. I will not just focus only on the singles this morning. I'm going to just go ahead and revise this a little bit and just, comp and just focus on companionship overall. You know, so that I will be able to address or try to address whatever your particular situation is as it relates to companionship. One thing I do want to emphasize, unlike marriage, but this is inclusive of those that are widows and widowers, single companionship has to be followed by a certain protocol and rules of engagement. <laughs> okay, so what I want you to do know is that because I had initially prepared this for singles as I'm going along now and I know that there are people here who maybe are divorced or separated or widows or widowers, now I have to revise this teaching. So. Please bear with me as I begin to make the revisions according to my previous notes. The first and most obvious one is there is no sex, sex allowed, petting, fondling, and even French kissing is questionable within the confounds of the singleness and companionship. So again, First of all, the most obvious one is that there is no sex allowed, 
petting, fondling, and even French kissing when you are in a relationship that is within the sphere of being single. In some instances, I don't want to go overboard, but even in some instances, hand-holding may be a little excessive, but in some cases, most often, it's acceptable. So I don't want to get a little too, you know, go overboard, but in some situations, hand-holding is acceptable. One of the things that we have to be careful about in terms of companionship and the single individual is spending excessive time alone should be avoided because it can create an atmosphere where the enemy can get a foothold and lead the single people astray. Especially if you have a man or a woman who is given to temptation whether it's the female or whether it's the male, if either one of them are sensitive or are very sensitive or are struggling in the area of sexual lust, that is an area where they need to be very vigilant when it comes to companionship in a relationship with another individual. So again, this bears repeating. In a single relationship, when it refers to companionship, spending excessive time alone should be avoided because it can create an atmosphere where the enemy can get a foothold and lead you astray. And just to clarify that, to give true and strong language to that. When I say lead you astray, which means lead them into the, the act of fornication, which is a very serious sexual sin. The biblical text says that all sin that we do is outside the body, but he that commits fornication and adultery sins against his own body and our body, as we know, is a temple of God. And so if we sin or engage in the act of fornication or adultery, we are sinning against the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us. Companionship among singles should be a time for you to get to know the other person. Sometimes we can get off track and allow the weaknesses in our lives, especially if we're dealing with the weaknesses of lust, to get in the way and allow that to be a hindrance for us to take the time of dating and companionship and to allow that to be a time to get to know the other person. Now that I have addressed companionship, I'm going to move on to the other topic, which is being an empty nester. We become empty nesters at various ages, seasons, and circumstances in our lives. And although it may leave some of us with feelings of loss, sadness, and some even of no longer having a genuine purpose in life. Especially those parents who have spent the majority or all of their children's lives giving all of their attention to them. When they finally leave the home and we find ourselves as empty nesters, we all may experience various emotions. It varies from person to person. For me personally, when I became an empty nester, the emotions that I felt were, I was no longer needed. My children no longer needed me. So I dealt with those emotions. So now what I do? But when we become empty nesters, 
that is the perfect time that we can reinvent ourselves and we can begin a new season in our lives and not see being empty nesters as a loss but seeing it as a gain so again when we become empty nesters at various ages seasons and circumstances in our lives and although it may leave some with feelings of loss sadness like my said the loss of no longer feeling needed or whatever the emotion that you may have experienced when you became an empty nester look at it from the positive perspective and look at it as a new beginning i had shared just a few minutes ago that becoming an empty nester left me with feelings of a loss of purpose some people even have feelings of unhappiness and again i'm repeating this that they no longer felt needed but we can look at this positively as a new beginning a new season and a new way of reinventing ourselves what is it that you have always wanted to do but put off because you were raising a family what is on your personal bucket list now because you have become an empty nester or maybe you are or have been an empty nester for many years what is on your bucket list so now that you have become an empty nester that you can be you can begin pursuing your bucket list what are you passionate about often when we're young we have passions we had dreams there was something that we wanted to do but subsequently you found someone you fell in love and you had to put that dream or you had to set that passion aside because now you had to focus on being a husband or focus on being a wife and you began raising a family and all of a sudden that dream was lost and that passion is still there but it's deep down on the inside of you and you had to put it away for a later time now is the time to re to resurrect that passion or that dream what is it that i can now do that i put off many years ago before i began raising a family now that you have more time have you considered volunteering in your church your community or even going back to school now that you have more time have you considered volunteering in your church your community or going back to school how about getting connected with your spouse again and possibly renewing your your wedding vows often times when we get married and we spend so much time and focus and energy on raising our children often our spouses become or get neglected and so after the children leave the home you have to begin again to start the process of getting to know your spouse again because you have lost the connection that you initially had when you got married but you gave so much time to being a provider or raising the children and being a uh, uh, providing for the home or home caretaker you lost touch with each other so now that the children are gone you can take this time to get reconnected with your spouse again and possibly even consider renewing your wedding vows taking or taking that long awaited vacation and scratching out one of those things from your bucket list 
Because this is fresh in your mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take a few seconds for you to jot down a couple of things that maybe is on your bucket list or you can put on your bucket list. Put three things on there right quick. But put something on your bucket list that is realistic, that is doable, that you can do, that is not going to take a lot of time, it's not going to take a lot of effort, it may not require a lot of my resources, but you know what? I am going to do it. I am going to take the time and I am going to literally smell the roses. Amen. I can double 20, I can double 30, I possibly can double 40, long shot at doubling 50, but I know I have more life behind me than I have before me. What is it that I feel compelled to do that I will not leave this earth empty? When I, when I go on to be with the Lord, what is it that I want it to be said of me? What do I want to leave behind? What type of legacy do I want to leave my children? Now that you are empty nester, be good to yourself. After having taken care of everyone else for so long, now it's time for you to take care of yourself. Transition. Transition can be a very troubling and bewildering time in our lives. Because transition is an indicator of, I know where I am right now, but I'm not quite sure where I'm going. Transition is a time that we go through that is something that we have not manifested on our own. But as an illustration, I would say it's like an eagle who begins to stir up the nest. So usually when we sense that there is a transitioning happening in our lives, we have to perceive that as God is doing something in us because he's getting ready to take us to a new place. So transition is not always a comfortable place or doesn't always feel comfortable, but always know that the transition that you are experiencing internally, that it's going to be good because God is the initiator. Amen. Transition is also a good time for us to take inventory as to where we are currently. Where am I? What do I perceive as a particular season in my life? What is the vision that God has given me? And how much of that vision have I fulfilled? And how much yet is there to be fulfilled? Transition generally comes when God is about to wrap up our current state of vision because he's getting ready to take us to a new place. God may even give you some glimpse of or indication in your spirit where your transition is going to take you so that you can prepare for the transition and be ready and equipped when you get there so that you will be able to step into it very comfortably. Trans
transition can also affect our DNA. And our DNA is just simply our genetic coding. It can affect our DA and our, and our human DNA in our mind, our will, our emotions, and in our spirit. It is like a total paradigm shift in our thinking. It affects every aspect of our being. And we readily acknowledge that God is doing something because I recognize that I am not the person that I used to be. I'll give you an example when I talk about transition and having a paradigm shift in our thinking. Just having a paradigm means the way you thought and looked at a situation in one way. When you have a paradigm shift, that means you begin to think and look at that same situation differently. That's what a paradigm is. For, as an, it's for another example, this is this is maybe a better illustration. When a senator or a congressman walks into the Capitol, because of their relationship to the Capitol as congressmen and senators, they see the Capitol building from a different perspective than we do, amen? They may walk in with a, a spirit of pride and arrogance, but we, as individuals, we're not politicians. When we walk into the US Capitol, we walk in as visitors. So the way we look at the Capitol building is not gonna be from the perspective of I'm a lawmaker. You know, I'm one of the people that makes the laws for the United States. We're gonna look at it maybe and oh wow, I'm in the Capitol. Look at all the the statues of the presidents and the, you know, the ex-presidents, they lie here in state when they die or just look at the beautiful, you know, frescoes or whatever is in the Capitol building. That's how we look at it. So that's what paradigm means, the way we look at something based on our relationship to it. So when we are in transition, we have a change in our DNA, so it affects the way we look at things, but it affects our total being, our spirit, our body, our mind, our will, and our emotions. But transition is always a good thing, especially when we are walking with the Lord. Amen. I'm going to go on to the next one, which is traveling as a single person. Because I am teaching this from the perspective of a traveling minister as a female, what you'll have to do is if you are called to the traveling ministry, you will have to interchange the feminine details of this teaching and make it applicable to the male. Amen? Okay? So I'm going to speak on it from the perspective of how I see it from my paradigm as traveling as a single woman. Um, I, I felt for some reason I have inserted here in this particular teaching that I wanted to share with you that a part of my prophetic history is that I had been given a prophetic word back in 2005. And a part of the prophetic word that I was given was that I would have to become like a hot air balloon in God's hand. 
And so, in essence, to interpret what that prophetic word meant, it meant that if God said to me, Eleanor, I want you to go there. And the perfect example that we have is Philip from the biblical text. Remember, Philip was doing something for the Lord, and the Ethiopian eunuch was in his chariot or whatever mode of transportation he was in, and he was reading from the book of Isaiah. And actually, he was reading about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit knew that someone needed to come alongside the eunuch and to interpret for him exactly what he was reading out of that prophecy of the book of Isaiah. And so whenever we're searching for God, God will send someone to you. If you're truly a seeker of God or truly seeking to understand the word of God, God will make it his priority to get someone to you to bring understanding to you from his word. So like Philip, the Lord the, what the Lord is saying to me or was saying to me through this prophetic word, Eleanor, I need you to become like a hot air balloon. If I say to you, Eleanor, I need you in Oklahoma, all my response should be is, yes, Lord, when? The Lord says to Eleanor, I need you in Jerusalem. My response should be, yes, I hear you, Lord. I should give the Lord no argument as to why I can't do what he has asked me to do. My response is, here am I, Lord, speak. The protocol for a single woman in the traveling ministry is that she should never travel alone. But sometimes this can't be helped. But when she does travel alone, or God does not provide someone to travel with her, she has the confidence of knowing that she can travel without fear because the Lord goes before her the angels encompass her. They are beside her and behind her, leading and guiding and protecting her on her path. So the protocol is that a woman, a single woman, should never travel alone in the traveling ministry. If God has opened a door for you, and it requires traveling alone. Go in faith and peace and know that God is with you. I have been in very remote cities in the country, <laughs> in various states, driving alone in my car. And I can remember one very viv vividly when I was on a ministry trip down in the Dallas Fort Worth area and I had initially traveled with a team but for some reason we all separated and went our separate ways we didn't come back as a team so I had to travel back to Oklahoma Tulsa Oklahoma where I was living at the time from the Dallas Fort Worth area and somehow I missed my turn and instead of getting on the highway, I took the bypass. And we know when you take the bypass and you do not travel on the primary highway, the bypass is more desolate, is more remote, um, it's, it's, it's just, there's basically nothing there. There are few cars there. You really don't see many people. You don't see many houses. And I traveled for a very long distance before I even saw another car. And even though I had my phone, my cell phone with me, I could not get a single, a signal 
on my cell phone. <laughs> and I was rather disturbed. But I stayed in faith and I kept my peace and I knew what God's word said and I just kept my faith and I just stayed in peace and just said, Lord, your eyes are upon me and you know exactly where I am. And I tell you, I honestly must have traveled an hour or half or two and I did not pass one single car nor did I have a cell phone signal and I was literally alone but I had the word of God and I knew that God knew exactly where I was and that is just one example. I have traveled across this country by car, by myself. But I have always traveled in faith and I've always traveled in peace because I knew that the Lord was with me. Now one thing I want to say from the natural perspective Always, it's wisdom to make sure that you have a good car that is in sound, mechanical, working order before you get on the road. That's just wisdom. We don't have to spiritualize everything. It's just wisdom to make sure that your car is roadworthy, especially when you are driving across the country or halfway across the country, just make sure that your vehicle is a sound, is a sound, sound vehicle. And ladies, make sure, and men as well, that you always have plenty of gas. I can give you an example. I was traveling from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And I went through the, uh, I was coming out of South Louisville. I had stopped there overnight. I was, had just left uh, Kansas City, Missouri. And it was a two day trip. And so I, that's basically coming across half of the country. And I was traveling alone, uh, leaving Kansas City, Missouri. And I was coming to the east coast of North Carolina. And it was a two day trip. And I stopped over in Louisville, Kentucky. And as I left Louisville, I believe I may have had maybe a half a tank of gang, a half a tank of gas. I'm not quite sure, but on that half half a tank of gas, I was able to get to a service station because I was literally in the mountains of Kentucky. In the mountains of Kentucky. And from Louisville, Kentucky, through the other side of Louisville, I don't remember what city I was in, but I was about to, I was halfway, halfway through Kentucky and about to, to begin to make my way into West Virginia, did I finally see a sign, a tall sign, that where I was able to get gas. So I've also learned that before I leave any city, always fill my tank full of gas first because you never know if there is going to be a service station when you leave one city and state until you get to the next. Amen? So, I have been in various remote cities in various states driving alone in my car and most, of, most often what I was surprised about was that these people lived in the most out of way places. And I was so surprised that how did this person come to live back here? Who would have thought that people actually live this far back inland off of the highway? And so that was one of the most surprising things that I found is that how remote people live off 
in the inland in some of these states in some of the most out of the way places that I've ever seen. But one thing I also want to say again, it bears repeating, make sure when you drive across the country, make sure you have a reliable vehicle and make sure that you always have a full tank of gas when you leave the city or the state that you're in to go to another city and state. It is also vitally in person it is, I'm sorry, it is also vitally important if you can travel as a team versus, in, versus traveling alone. It's safer to travel as a team, and that would be two or more persons. So if, if, if at all possible, try and travel as a team. Also, the fellowship when you're on the road is so sweet when you travel as a team. And because always remember that there's safety in numbers. One of the most challenging things that I find as a single woman traveling in the ministry is when it comes to sharing your hotel room. I'm not much given to wanting to share my space. But one missionary said to me one time, she says, when you are in the traveling ministry, whether you are traveling nationally or internationally, you have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And this bears repeating. When you are traveling in the ministry, and this is applicable to female and male as well, we have to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Especially if you are a person where it's very difficult, if you are very resistant to change and it's very difficult for you to get outside of your comfort zone, that is going to be one of the things that you're really going to have to deal with if you're called to the traveling ministry. Because there are going to be a lot of times, more often than not, probably 99%, you are going to be on the outside of your comfort zone. So you're going to have to get used to that, of being comfortable outside of your comfortable zone. Most of all, the biblical text encourages us to stay in one another's homes when we are on the road traveling. So that should be your first, your first uh, mode of looking for housing is to see if another brother or sister in the Lord are willing to open their home to, with you and to break bread with you and to have fellowship with you because that is God's perfect model for those of us that travel in the ministry is to have fellowship with the body of Christ when we travel. Because what it does is it encourages the brothers and sisters for the itinerant ministers when we are in their church ministering or when we're in their state to come and have fellowship and to break bread with them in their homes. So first of all, we should seek to stay in their homes and then secondarily, if the finances permit, to have the ability to stay in a hotel. Also, you have to be willing to travel at different stages of your spiritual development and maturity.
Thank you, Pastor Eleanor Joy. I'm Apostle Julie Hardy and an ordained pastor, and today we're talking to you about companionship, empty nesters, making transitions, and traveling. Some of these things apply to married people, but uh, we had this conference, uh, singles conference, and uh, just it ministers to all people, not just single people. Uh, I would like to talk to you about companionship. Uh, do you have a companion? Do you desire a companion? There's many options. A pet, a sister, a brother, a mother, a grandmother, grandparent, grandfather, other family members, uh, special friends. There are five basic concepts to consider for companionship. These are uh, good concepts to keep. If you want to get your a pen handy, you can write them down, and they are scripture-oriented. Uh, uh, five concepts you should use in every decision that you're making, not just companionship. Number one, Philippians 3 talks about make, make sure your mindsets are godly. Number two, 1 Peter 1, verse 15 through 17, be ye holy as God is holy. Number three, found in John 8. Uh, note, uh, you can read all of John 8, but verse 11. Love one another without sinning. Number four, find your answers in the Holy Bible and through prayer. 2 Timothy 3.16. Number five, enjoy the journey. Isaiah 35, verse 8. You can, uh, if you have a pen handy, I, I'll just let you do that as homework. I have some of uh, the other topics that I want to give you as well. Um, if we have more time, I'll come back and read those, those verses. I'd like to talk to the people that are empty nesters, or if you're going to be an empty nester, that applies as well. Are you an empty nester? Do you have a vision for your life? Have you had to let go of children and parents and you feel like you don't have uh, a vision or you're ready to be free from all of that and you're happy about it? But if you are an empty nester, you should still consider doing the work of the Lord. Um, God's, it's God's will that uh, uh, we have a vision for a life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Do you have a future and a hope as an empty nester? God wants you to have a future and a hope. And I pray that God will get, bring things to your mind that you can do uh, for your future so you will not be in hopelessness. Definitely, if you're not in the church, find a church home. Uh, even if you're watching church on television, you should be plugged into a body of Christ, a church home. If they preach holiness from the pulpit, it's a safe place to be. If they preach word for word, right out of the Holy Bible, without twisting it around to suit uh, uh, sinful natures, then it's a safe place to be. Uh, it's okay to try a few different churches and, and see where you have peace and where you feel like you fit in. Uh, that's just one place that God would want you to have a future in. You could grow in the things of the Lord if you're not already doing that. If you are growing in things of the Lord and uh, feel like you've been abandoned by family members and your children or you're an empty nester, uh, just draw close to the Lord and He will draw close to you. Let's read Proverbs 29, verse 18. I'm reading from the New King James uh outreach Bibles that we use uh, to equip people that don't have Bibles. If you do not have a Holy Bible, please give us a call at 763-544-7700 and we can get you a Bible. If you have the finances to go buy one, you can go take a look at several different options or what, what uh, might be your favorite to, to look. We are using the New King James right now. Proverbs 29, verse 18 says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. 
but happy is he who keeps the law. Other versions say that uh, God's people perish without a vision. Don't let your dreams die inside of you. Is there a treasure that God has placed inside of you that's dormant and that you could use for his glory? If you're an empty nester, uh, try to do the things of the Lord. Try to do work for the Lord because that's the only gift we can give back to God is our time and our talents that he's put inside of us. If you can change your mindsets to stay out of the worldly things uh, and get into the things which will bring God glory and, and pleasure, I just uh, uh, would hope that would uh, help not only you but others. Uh, if your children are all, all grown up and, and you need a change, uh, so be it. If they don't need you anymore as a parent, so be it. Uh, life, part of life is just making changes and uh, letting go of things. You're tired of them taking food out of your refrigerator and you want to move, you want to downsize from a big house to an apartment onto a houseboat or something, uh, that's okay too. So, uh, what types of things can an empty nester do that are godly, that might be part of your gift? You could write, sing, paint, dance for the Lord, get a mentor, you can mentor others, get discipled, you could disciple others, you could witness about your faith in Jesus Christ. You could travel. When you're traveling, though, make sure you have your eyes and ears open to seeing the work of the Lord. You might be going uh, traveling and not realize that somebody doesn't know Jesus. And God's going to place people all around you that don't know, people that don't know Jesus yet. So if you could carry some gospel tracts and just witness in, in the language that where you're traveling to with the nation that you're come, going to, take some of the type uh, gospel tracts in their language that they will understand. And make sure you just try to, try to do something for the Lord when you're traveling. It's not all about us, it's about Him. We have to get smaller so he can get. In, we have to get smaller so God can increase. Um, as an empty nester, maybe you just need the rest. Um, rest from taking care of people. Maybe you want to sew or learn how to use a sewing machine or cook. Um, you don't have to be an empty nester to follow some of these teachings. Uh, you know, please do so if you're not an empty nester. That something stands out to you and you want to do something. Just if God speaks to you, so be it. Go into all the nation and preach the gospel. You could go into missions. You could be a missionary. You could go on a missions trip. You could see how other areas uh, live. Uh, you could help children. You could tutor. You could volunteer to help others. What is your vision for your future as an empty nester? When you're taking transitions, uh, I'd just like to uh, say don't look back. Uh, the Holy Spirit told me not to look back when he asked when I went through retirement for uh, my construction job. He just I just said I was on my way to the Union Hall uh, with a disability layoff, and and the Holy Spirit just spoke and said, "Don't look back." God's timing for change is different than ours, so that's why we always need to pray for God's will to be done. Sometimes God speaks to people through dreams and visions, and sometimes a bridge is a transition, a, a tunnel is a transition. Um, in your in your dreams, the um, he might show you a dream of somebody else or or change on the ground. A lot of change, a lot of there's big change. Like a quarter would be a big change, a half dollar would be a big change. So sometimes he speaks to people in uh, transitions or uh, change, making changes in your life. He wants to prepare people for those changes. Um, change. Uh, so transitions aren't always easy, especially if we've gotten uh, fired, laid off, or the job market uh, closed for that type of work. A lot of people suffer um, in, because they haven't been prepared for transitions properly. So if you haven't been prepared for transition, just uh, release the control of the, the situations and just let God minister to you if he have a, has a transition coming for you. He wants you to enjoy the journey. He doesn't want you to stay in depression or be oppressed. He doesn't want you to go down to, into drinking or binging or an other uh, self-destructive uh, uh, habits because of a, a change. He wants to be able to open new doors for you and 
and show you new things. So just be encouraged. And some of the dreams I've had, uh, the bridges and tunnels, uh, change on the ground, quarters, uh, time, lots of change. And uh, big changes would be like a quarter in a dream or, and a, or a lot of big changes. Uh, my mother uh, had uh, some changes that had happened, but God prepared me not to worry about her be in a dream. He showed me after my mom had three brain aneurysms that she was standing on a, a really strong countertop. And what I interpreted that dream to me was she had strong support. My mother was standing by herself, but she had strong support. So I just was encouraged by that. Um, she had to make some changes, and my father had to make some changes, but they came through it, and they're doing pretty well. So I'm just thankful for the God's healing in that and his, his helping me of making that transition. Uh, and knowing my mother and father were going to make some transitions. It, uh, change can also be a distraction if God gives you a dream sometimes about, uh, for example, I've, I've seen this a, in a couple times and somebody thought I was totally wrong with the dream, but I know that God was showing me that be, because of the distraction aspect. Uh, in a casino, she was walking past a, a slot machine and all this change was coming down and she kept looking back at it. And, and I told her the interpretation was that change God was saying that she was being distracted, that the, the, the changes were going to cause her distraction. So she also was in a casino, which was also a distraction to the work of the Lord. So to be able to put all those things in, in to a proper perspective for you, you would probably have to, to interpret those types of things for yourself. So money falling in a dream doesn't always mean uh, you're going to have a lot of money coming to you. Sometimes it just means that you'll have favor of God. And maybe sometimes it means favor of God and favor of man. But as you go through transitions, just ask God for those things in prayer, that the transition, that he would prepare you for the transition, that the transition would uh, uh, not be hard on you, that he would give you a, a, a vision for the transition, that uh, you would have favor, uh, his favor for the transition, that uh, it would, you would not uh, suffer from the transition, that he would just really uh, wrap his arms around you as he wants you to make. Sometimes it's a big change. Sometimes the big changes are hard. God's timing for change may be different than ours, so that is why we always need to pray for God's will to be done. If you have your pen handy, you can look at Mark 1, verses 14 and 15, and Acts 8, 26. Uh, traveling, uh, always use wisdom when you're traveling. Use good judgment and planning. Uh, do, you, are you, do you travel on the spur of the moment? Uh, do you plan your trips? Are you flying? Are you driving? Are you walking? Make sure you're trying to do the work of the Lord. Always be a light in a dark place. Verse Matthew 5, 16. Stay where you are received. Matthew 10. Take nothing with you. Mark 6, verse 8. Stay where you are received again. Luke 9, 5. Eat what they prepare for you within reason. Uh, you can read Luke 10, note verse 7. Be a good example with good actions. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When you're traveling, definitely have patience when you're traveling. Good to